Thank you very much, Mike. Um, so as an introduction, uh, my name's Jamie, uh, and I've just started at the LSE, uh, which uh, doesn't do much in terms of computer science, but has a, a, a big social science school uh, in central London. Um, and I've worked at, I think, seven universities now since the end of my PhD, which was two and a half years ago. Uh, so I have, uh, you know, the kind of typical uh, early stage uh, precarious academic career. I'm really a sociologist, uh, but I work in a business school, uh, and I've been doing some work with computer scientists just to kind of uh, complicate things. Uh, what I want to start with is, is a thank you to Mike, um, because I think this is a fantastic event. Uh, but I also want to start with uh, a caveat. Uh, I don't make games, uh, nor do I write code, uh, and my technical background is, is somewhat limited. Uh, but I'm an ethnographer, um, and so I wanted to give, I don't know how familiar people are with the term ethnography, uh, so I wanted to give a quick kind of definition of what I'm talking about. Uh, so for me, ethnography is, is both a kind of research method, but also the output of what I do. So I, I write up kind of rich experiences, well, hopefully rich experiences, uh, of what I've done, and it's observing things in their context. Uh, so I've previously done research on uh, low-paid, casualised working call centres, where I worked undercover in a call centre, uh, and we tried to organise a trade union branch, uh, and it's a, it's a story with, a, with an ending of a, a, a particular kind. Uh, but with Mike, uh, I was doing a bit of kind of ethnography, some of it undercover, some not, around how uh, software developers make things, how research is carried out in various ways. Um, and so the first, uh, the first finding, which... You know, I think it's always interesting to kind of problematize the way we do our work or the way we do uh, research. And so the first finding for me working with, with Mike and some other people was that you don't use Word to write things, uh, which for me was just mind-blowing. You know, seeing somebody said, oh, you know, we should write something together, and seeing LaTeX for the first time was like, oh, okay, even our common reference point of how we construct words is, uh, is different. Um, so what I want to talk about today is understanding PCG uh, from the perspective of the labour process. Uh, and what I mean by this is, uh, I'm going to take you back a little bit of theory before I go on to, to, to PCG, which is hopefully uh, helpful, is for me, as a sociologist, I understand the world by how it's constructed by people's activity. So the kind of labour that we do, the kind of work that we do is how society is constructed. We construct and reconstruct the world through the way that we uh, interact uh, with the world. So from the kind of very simplest levels of finding ways for us to be able to have food, clothe ourselves, have housing, to the more complicated procedurally generated stories and uh, you know, billions of, of procedurally generated uh, worlds. And what I want to do is, I kind of, you know, I'm aware I'm speaking across disciplinary boundaries, so I thought I'd try and find a common reference point that we could then talk about why this is important. So what I'd uh, like to start with is, is Marx in the, the most recent Assassin's Creed game. Uh, and this is kind of riffing off a paper that I've written about how we understand the production of video games as a kind of blurring of work and play in various ways. Uh, so Marx appears in the latest Assassin's Creed game. I don't know if anybody's played this and came across the, the, the kind of uh, side missions you can do with Marx. But he, he kind of appears at one moment, you know, this is... Victorian London in the throes of the Industrial Revolution, and he tries to recruit the two uh, assassins to, to do a task for him. You know, the first one is causing a little bit of trouble. The second one is a bit more interesting. So he says, the working people in London, you can see the plight of their conditions. I really need your help. I need you to set fire to uh, some bales of, uh, of cotton, uh, of course, because that's going to be the, the, the strategy, but to go into the factory under the confusion and steal the reports of the factory workers and bring these back to me. So I really have an understanding of what's going on uh, in, in a particular workplace. Because Marx, for much of his time, wrote big treaties on, on capital, on the kind of workings of capitalism. But towards the end of his career, uh, and you know, I kind of like the idea that perhaps he recruited two uh, you know, uh, assassins with hidden blades and, and rope launchers and so on. But the, the kind of reality is much more boring for Marx. Is he, he started doing a series of questionnaires and surveys. He was desperate to find out what happened in factories with people, what their experiences were like, how the work affected them. You know, he asked, and as a social scientist now, we can look back on this and, and maybe problematise it. He tried to send out 101 questions to factory workers that they would answer. Um, there's no record of him ever getting these back. But it kind of shows this intention to move beyond understanding capitalism as a system, as a kind of abstract system, to actually understanding how 
capital and capitalism affects people in a day-to-day -day way. So he called this a kind of workers' inquiry. And I think, you know, to try and update Marxist theory or critical theory for today, I kind of, what I'm trying to propose is not to, to go and set fire to bells of, of, of cotton, but rather that the people who actually make things, the people who are actually there at the point of production, are the people who can tell us most about how these processes work. So, what on earth does this have to do with PCG, you might be asking. Um, and the, what I want to do is to return to something that I think is quite useful when talking about the labour process, is when we interact with the world, we use tools. We use tools of various kinds to interact with the world. Uh, this is how we reproduce our own basis of living. This is how we create complex structures. But Marx makes an important distinction between a tool and a machine. So if a tool is just something that we utilise, a machine is a mechanism that, after being set in motion, performs with its tools the same operation as the worker did with similar tools. And what I want to argue is that we've discussed kind of the outputs of PCG, maybe potentially the inputs, but I want to draw attention to the way in which we set these things in motion. You know, what is the, the, the labour input into PCG? What is it that's being put into motion uh, kind of algorithmically or, or automatically? And through this, I want to argue that labour is central to our understanding of it. You know, the, the way that labour is congealed in these things, I think, is very important to understanding what kind of PCG we create, why we're creating it, who we create it for, and how it fits into society more broadly, perhaps. Now, I think this is important because there's been a lot of debate recently around questions of automation. Uh, some of it not very helpful. Robots are going to come and take all of your jobs. Uh, these kind of arguments. But for me, I've been recently studying uh, digital labour in various kind of forms, and I'm very interested in software as the, the effect that software is having. So we can talk about software, I think, as affecting three kinds of work. So there's the, the actual work of creating software, which I think often most people don't understand or have much of an insight on, that software creates entirely new kinds of work, and that software transforms older kinds of work. And at its core, and I kind of don't want to explain software to a room full of people with much more expertise than me, it's about automation. And, you know, correct me if I'm, I'm wildly off base here. But within this automation, there's a promise of autonomy. We can automate things that are boring or mundane or, you know, of less interest to us. And we can have freedom from these more mundane aspects of life to focus on more creative things. But I think the problem here is who has control over these things. You know, who is making the choices about the kind of things that we're able to do? And so, I want to argue, with my picture of a robot Marx, <laughs> that automation is contested. So we often think of automation, and you can look back to the early writings of an economist called uh, John Maynard Keynes, who argues in the 40s that technology and automation will provide the basis for us to work two, three-day weeks. You know, we won't have to work as much. Technology will automate out of this process and we'll be left, you know, figuring out what we're going to do with our leisure time. You know, what will we do with all that free time? Now, you know, anyone who has, has an experience of the world of work knows that we don't work a couple of days a week. Uh, we've actually, you know, working weeks increase and in the UK, uh, you know, compared to Europe, we have a, a, a far higher uh, working week. And so what I want to argue is that there's always been a, con a contestation in this process. Things are not just automated. Uh, and I want to give, not going quite as far back to Marx, but some examples from factory automation. So when factory automation happens, it seems like a natural event. You automate a part of the process. You bring in a machine to do it. But when you start to unpick how these things happen, it's often not the most effective, uh, you know, the most technologically advanced methods that come to dominate. And there's a case for something called a machine lathe, which is a machine that I believe shapes bits of metal. Uh, there are two rival ways that you could, you could automate this. You could do it through numerical control or you could do it through recording. Now, the one that became dominant, numerical control, wasn't the most technically superior. It wasn't the most effective way to do this. But what it did do was effectively lock those workers out of the process who'd done it before. So it had an element of control, it had an element of efficiency, but it didn't produce the most superior product at the end. And so what I want to argue is that when we think about technology in this way, we need to think about how it's constituted through rival interests, through struggles around what's the best way to do something. And 
I also want to argue that for software development, this is also a pressure. I think particularly when we look at the video games industry, yes, there are large costs for equipment and for licensing fees and all these kind of things. But the, the labor input, the paying developers, represents a huge cost in software development. And the history of software development is also a history of trying to rule out the more craft-like elements, the kind of rule of thumb. It's about trying to standardize parts of this and introduce ways that it can be more effectively managed, for want of a better word. Um, so what does this mean about PCG? Uh, so I don't know if people are familiar with the Dyer Witherford uh, and Greg DePuta book, but I think uh, you know, this situates these things very much within an argument around, well, as I say, global ownership, privatized property, coercive class relations, military operations, and radical struggle, seeing how these things are constituted by the social relations that all of us operate within. We don't make games in a vacuum. You know, games are shaped by the world around us. And so what I want to argue uh, is that if we can consider that's how these things come into being, I'm going to propose that there are two tendencies in, in procedural content generation. The first, which I'm going to clumsily label AAA, is a pressure to reduce costs, to find out how to produce more, more content while cutting down on labor costs, to make games cheaper, to maybe produce that perfect game that you can, you know, you can play forever because the content has been, has been churned out. And what I think this is about is about imposing constraints on the development process. It's about finding ways to you know, get a better return on investment, to make more profit from something. And I'm kind of aware that the talk yesterday, we heard about how you know, in sport it didn't actually reduce the labor costs. You know, actually, they ended up spending quite a lot more time on it. And I think with a tool like PCG, like many tools, when they're first introduced, they can be very expensive. And just because something doesn't necessarily at first reduce costs doesn't mean over the long time that can be the intention behind it. Now, the second, again, you know, perhaps slightly clumsy label, is to say that there's a kind of indie tendency, you know, one that's away from uh, that, those kind of pressures, which is about being able to do more with less. So about maximizing the possibilities of what smaller groups of people, perhaps less resourced, are, are, are able to do. Now, when we consider PCG as a machine, therefore, we see that it can have those interests written into it. What were the intentions behind the people paying for it? the people who designed it, the people who then go on to use it. And in order to understand this, I want to draw on a concept uh, that, again, Marx talks about, which is the, the coincidence of change and self-change. That whenever we use a tool, that tool in turn shapes us in various ways. You can think about the kind of simplest, earliest examples. When we start to make tools in the Stone Age, these have an effect on how our societies develop. You know, when we start using fire or uh, or arrowheads and so on, they start to have quite obvious effects. In the factory, we're disciplined in various ways. We start to have a notion of time, of arriving on time for something. Now that time has to be on a granular level. We have to know what minute it is so that we can be told off if we don't turn up on time. Before that, time's less important. The car begins to shape how we think of the world, you know, what's achievable, where, we, where can we go, and so on. And then, of course, the computer shapes us in, in a huge manner of ways, um, and it's particularly interesting at the moment, the use of, uh, of mobile phones outside the Western world is reshaping how people access work, how they pay for things, how they, uh, how they interact with other people. And I want to argue that in the same way, I think PCG is having an effect on people, and we need to talk about the effect of using that as a tool. And I'm sure people are familiar with some of the arguments around middleware, but I want to, to reiterate a couple of them. As Graham Kirkpatrick has argued, we can see the creative role of designers and developers face off against economic imperatives of efficient production for a competitive market, reflected in the demands of publishers and console manufacturers and embedded in that, in, in, embodied in that technology. I want to argue two things, that middleware narrows the range of options available and creates more homogenized games. Now, perhaps this isn't groundbreaking for some of you. I'm seeing a couple of nods in the, in the audience. But I also want to think about the, the implicit ways that it does this, by shutting down the fields of possibilities that we haven't even started to imagine yet. But the second one, which I think is, in some ways, you know, they're both problematic, but I think this one leads to, 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 to greater problems, is how the labor process becomes rationalized. You can start to break it down into, 
constitutive blocks that you can then say outsource to somewhere else or you know you can lower the skill level involved and pay people less to do it and I think these are two tendencies which we could see being expressed in how we make PCG generators perhaps the kind of generators that we make they start to shut down various fields of possibilities whilst they open very important ones at the same time now I think in order to, to, to talk through what this means in terms of PCG specifically, I want to talk about the concept of black boxes, which at the moment is very popular in social science. I'm sure uh, to other people this is, is a term they've come across. Um, but Frank Pasquale writes about this in Black Box Society, that increasingly elements of our, uh, of our society are being governed or controlled or uh, measured or managed behind systems that we don't understand the inputs or necessarily the outputs behind them. And I think a great example of this is, is algorithmic finance, which, you know, trading happening on the kind of micro millisecond level, huge amounts of money being moved around with very little human interaction, the effects of which shape all of our lives, whether we know about it or not. And I was struck by a description of, uh, of the spore designers talking about creating an artist in a box. Now, I think this is a nice analogy because, you're, you know, you're kind of humanizing the, the code, you're saying the, 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 the code is becoming an artist. But I also think it's problematic in a number of ways. Uh, what happens to the artist in this process? Once you've got your artist in a box, what happens to the labor that came before? You know, how do we see the input of those people who help to, to, to train the sculpting or texturing of a creature? Is that job over after that's been done? You know, how has their labor become embodied in it? Do they have some kind of claim on, uh, on the outputs from it? You could see in a major studio that once you've done that work, that's the end of your contribution. You know, you're then separated from something that's been trained on, on your labor. Um, and in Mike's fantastic uh, article on, on, on how we talk about uh, PCG, I think we need to try and move away, as Mike argues, from the idea that procedural generation is magic. Because when we talk about things as being governed by complex mathematics or things that people can't understand, you start to shut it off from other people. It becomes yet another thing in our society that's opaque something that we can't understand, something that we can just purchase the ends of it and hope that, you know, hope that, that, that we're getting what we want. So what I want to, as I start to draw towards a, con uh, a conclusion, is what does this mean for the kind of, uh, of procedural generation? You know, what, what are the implications of thinking of these things as tools and as tools that become machines and have labor embodied and entangled and congealed within them? Is I think, <laughs> We can talk about how these things disrupt our horizons, you know, offer us more possibilities. And I'm thinking particularly about the talk yesterday, the way that this can open up new spaces in how we, how we think about these things. But we also need to interrogate the process by which we make tools. You know, who are we consulting when we do this? How, you know, what's the role of the artist or the writer or these, these previous texts? How does that labor become congealed? Once it's in that process, is that the end of them being consulted on it? You know, what happens to the outputs when we come out of this? And I think as PCG, you know, there's been an explosion in its discussion around uh, No Man's Sky, but I think that's not going to be the end of its kind of public discourse. You can see how attractive capturing something like this for just making money would be. You know, you could see that purchasing products that promise you they're never going to end or, you know, they will have experiences that go on infinitely and so on is going to become more and more attractive to these kind of platforms that, that deliver us content. And I think what we have to worry about is the, the kind of the public understanding of this. You know, how do we know, how can we talk to people about the kind of products that they're buying? Because essentially it will be used as a kind of marketing scheme in which the people who originally contributed to these don't see the benefits of, uh, 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 of their labor in that process. Now, to conclude, Hopefully, uh, the, the kind of dual definition, you know, as a, uh, a critical sociologist, we like, and um, hopefully Mark can attest to this, we like setting things in contradiction with each other. So what I've tried to do is give you a sense of the two tendencies of PCG. Now, I'm sure in this room, the kind of things that are being produced are very much on that positive, <coughs> progressive, inclusive tendency. But I think we can't be... Uh, 
you know, we can't imagine that elsewhere there aren't people thinking of how PCG can be used to remove software developers, to reduce the, the, the reliance on artists, to find ways to separate people from the content they create and monetize and profit from it elsewhere. And so hopefully in this talk, what I've, uh, as a kind of prov provocation, is talked about not just thinking of the outputs of PCG or the inputs, but thinking about the process itself and that we need to talk about how we make things and how we do things and how we relate to, uh, to, to other people who are working on it, but also to, uh, to kind of downstream and upstream from how it's being produced. And I want to finish by arguing that I think there's a struggle over what kind of games are produced. The struggle between big business and indie developers or software developers and managers shapes the kind of games we get. The kind of demographics of the software industry shapes the kind of games that are produced. And these things are constituted by struggles over what games should look like. And I think we need to imbue PCG with an element of that too. You know, what kind of PCG is produced is not a neutral output, but it's one that's constituted through social relations in society today. Thank you very much. So, is repeating the question useful for the stream? So, comparing PCG as a machine to the famous example of the paperclip AI that destroys the whole world to, to make enough paperclips. Uh, I certainly don't want to say that by, by thinking of a tool and a machine in this way, the output is homogenized. Because labor is immensely creative. And when you imbue a machine with that labor, you know, of artistic creation, literature, of film, of game studies in various ways, the output can be hugely creative. But the output is dependent on how our labor is embodied in those things. So it could be that you just create paper clips. But I think the thing to understand that, we need to look at the labor input. You know, how is, how is our creative process embodied in that? Does that help to answer your question? Okay, I see what you mean. I think when we think about those kind of homogenized products that come out, is that often those things aren't the result of a creative labor in the same way. They're often the result of marketing. So focus groups, you know, finding something that is most popular to the largest number of people, which means that you don't get that kind of daring creative moment. You don't get things that challenge people in the same way. Uh, and that's because those are cultural products that are produced to make a profit not to elicit an emotional response or to have a longer dialogue with people. And so I think that's the risk with PCG, is that if it's seen as this wonderful tool that can create content at a much lower labor cost, it will be captured and used to create boring, banal things. And that misses the whole possibility of hopefully things you've discussed over Proc Jam. Peripherally, yeah. Well, you know about it. Yeah, yeah. And you
actually is more more important and vital and key than uh, creativity or, or value of the object. Um, so it really is a, a transgression to manage it a lot of the time. So I just wonder whether you thought there, there might be something like that on the cards. I mean, I guess that's one of the things that's exciting about video game production is it's so diverse. But increasingly, you have things pulling away between kind of AAA development and, and indie games. And I think you will see all kinds of things come out from indies who want to be discovered to set themselves apart from what's more popular elsewhere. And I know Mark's talked a bit about this in the way that <coughs> the kind of styles and genres and so on of, uh, 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 of games are increasingly pulling apart between those that are developed by the large publishers, which are increasingly centralized, and those that are more independent. Um, so yeah, I would have no doubt that you'll see entirely handmade things as a, as a kind of point across. And I think maybe what's more helpful is to think if you could use PCG to do something very, very interesting that reduces the amount of time you have to spend on it, what would you spend that time doing to improve the game? You know, if it's about extending the field of possibilities rather than lowering the amount of labor that's required, what else could you spend your time on? So I think there's a nice example with the storytelling there that if if you can create an 80-page book and then you can modify it and change it in various ways, that's broadening the possibilities. Whereas you could see that perhaps if you were just doing that to make money, you would churn out hundreds of those books and they would all be fairly similar and they wouldn't have that nice twist at the end. So does that make sense? Yeah. Um, we've got a break now so you'll be able to answer any more questions, I think, so we'll, we'll stop it there and thank Jamie one more time. Thank you very much. <laughs> just shamelessly plugging my book. <laughs> oh, yes, Jamie's got a book. It was absolutely incredible. If I'm right, you, you basically went undercover in a call center, right? And uh, it's basically a story of that, and it's coming out very, very soon. Yeah, it comes out in November, and also has the story of me being fired in it. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, feel free to grill Jamie, but we do have some coffee, I believe, outside this door. Um, and we'll be back in about 20 minutes. This one's a short break and a slightly longer one later. Um, thank you very much. Um,